Welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski. Prepared to have your mind blown by Dr. Datis Karazian, the world's top expert on autoimmunity. We also get into functional neurology and brain inflammation. So if you're someone who knows someone living with autoimmunity, or if you want to avoid autoimmunity, which as Dr. Karazian says, is becoming more and more prominent in our society. And also if you're someone who's looking to optimize your brain, you're absolutely going to love this conversation. I suggest you get out a pen, you get out a piece of paper, you sit down and enjoy it. There's a lot of uh, interesting dialogue and it's not too deep. There's definitely going to be some words in there you may not understand, but for the most part, there's a ton of actionable information that Dr. Krasian is so generous to share with us. Today's podcast is brought to you by Organifi. One of my favorite super greens powders is back sponsoring the podcast. Thank you so much to Organifi. O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com slash muscle will get you hooked up with 20% off. If you've never heard of Organifi before, you're absolutely going to love both the taste and the effect of their greens, of their reds, and their gold Organifi products are my three favorite that I've been using for the better part of five years. Organifi used to sponsor the podcast way back in 2018 and 19 because of my great relationship with their owner, Drew Cannoli. He's a previous guest in the podcast. He's an absolute brilliant guy who's got an incredible mission. Uh, Organifi is 100% glyphosate-free, 100% organic, and free of all major food allergens. Organifi blends use a lot of adaptogenic mushrooms and adaptogenic herbs to help your body improve function and ultimately recover from stress. If you don't know what an adaptogen is, ultimately it allows your body either to be more energized if you're feeling down or bring stress down if you're feeling too stimulated. And uh, so you guys are absolutely going to love the REDS product. The REDS product is actually one that I often use either pre-workout or post-workout and they have some really, really cool wind-down blends. If you guys haven't tried their golden milk formula, uh, I think Drew says it's like uh, Christmas made love to a marshmallow. It's absolutely delicious. And that's not lip service. It's fantastic stuff. I suggest you guys check out Organifi.com slash muscle. And use the code muscle to get hooked up with 20% off. Enjoy the podcast. Dr. Datis Karazi. I know you're an incredibly well-studied man and probably one of the most respected person, people in the entire space when it comes to functional neurology and ultimately autoimmunity. And I'm curious how you you took an interest in it. Well, I grew up as a child and I had a family member who had an autoimmune, she, autoimmune disease and she was very sick. And it really impacted the entire family dynamics of everyone involved. And it was very severe. And uh, she had gone through many, many different doctors in different countries and uh, really with no diagnosis and nothing really seemed to make much difference for her. And then one day um, she ended up in, in going to the alternative medicine route and a chiropractor that did clinical nutrition immediately changed her life with mm -hmm. just a few recommendations. And I go, okay, that was pretty amazing. <laughs> and then uh, later on, I go, okay, well, it became time to, what do I want to do? So this person that was working with uh, my family member became very influential. So I decided to, well, maybe I should go into chiropractic school and learn how to do clinical nutrition. And, and that's kind of where things started. And then as soon as I finished chiropractic, well, while I was in chiropractic school, you know, the family member still had issues. And then I met someone who was reading blood chemistry analysis. And I learned uh, a little bit about that. And then, um, and then once I, then I graduated, I got my master's degree in human nutrition because I realized I didn't get enough in school. I needed to learn more about it. And at that point, I met a gentleman named Rishta Vajdani when I graduated school. He was a PhD immunologist at a lab called Community Sciences. And I remember talking to him at a conference. And he said, uh, yeah, send me your mom. Send me uh, that's, send me, uh, yeah, you know, your person's uh, sample. And uh, we can test everything. And, then, and he did. And then this person had antibodies to serotonin and antibodies to dopamine. And I go, their, their own, this? their own dopamine and serotonin. Yeah. And I well, go, well, what is this? He's like, it's right. not, it's not a name disease. This is an, this is how autoimmune disease works. Autoimmune disease can act any, attack any tissue protein. And in my lab, we can test everything. So I tested everything I could find for you. And, uh, and I was referring a lot of people to his lab. I was lecturing all over the country at that point, um, really early on because I was so passionate about this stuff and had the opportunity to teach. And then he was showing his, his uh, return of uh, appreciation by having 
this panel done. So at that point, I was really blown away by you can have a person that suffers with an on with an autoimmune disease to any target protein, but it doesn't fit the classical diagnosis. And then from that point on, I got my doctor of health science degree because I wanted to learn more about research. And then I ended up following pursuing a PhD in immunology and toxicology, where I did some of my PhD work in Dr. Bajani's lab, where my focus was on finding how proteins uh, like albumin change in the blood. And as proteins bind to chemicals, they become a new antigen that then triggers an autoimmune response. My PhD was on fire retardants impacting neurological target proteins. And then I was very lucky to get um, to do my postdoc at Harvard Medical School, Department of Neurology. I was there for five years. And then I also did a master of medical science in clinical investigation, which is medical statistics and study design. So I went through this journey of everything from like general alternative to high level research. And uh, I try to publish two or three papers a year and still work in a clinical practice and try to blend uh, evidence-based medicine to a functional medicine approach and having the view of actually working with people suffering, seeing what happens with chronic patients, uh, and then seeing what the research is and over time learning how to read the research properly. And then, then I started teaching and then I developed my institute called the Crossing Institute. And we have about 3,000 uh, physicians and healthcare professionals that are now taking courses at the Crossing Institute. And we have our own network. We're all sharing information about chronic cases. And we're, we're all of us are on this journey to figure out what do we do with people that have illnesses sometimes unnamed and what can we do to improve their quality of life and function. And that's really been my journey. Wow. And you said fire retardants. Was that specifically uh, influenced by mattresses? Because that's the first place I think when I think of fire retardants. Yeah. So my research was on tetrabromal bisphenol A, which is uh, the similar structure for all, all other fire retardants. So well, with, you know, in your, in your human blood, this is my PhD work, in, in human blood we have albumin. As you know, albumin is mm-hmm. there to control osmotic pressure. It's the most abundant protein in blood. So the theory is, is if is if these chemicals get into us, you know, not all of it get excreted. So if you look at any kind of toxicology profile, any kind of chemical, the amount you take and the amount you measure going out, even over a long period of time, doesn't equal one to one, right? So right. some of it is left. Some of it, something happens to those other, other chemicals, and they can accumulate in body fat, they can accumulate in bone marrow, but they can also attach to our own proteins. And in the blood is the most likely area they can attach. So. Proteins in the blood, like albumin being the most abundant, can have chemicals bind to them. When chemicals bind to albumin, that becomes a completely new antigen, just like a pathogen that enters the body. So then that changes the the degree of uh, immune responsiveness to it. So we did an earlier study where we looked at 400 human subject patients and we just to see how many people had chemical antibodies. And we checked fire retardants, we checked things like EPA, uh, we checked isocyanates, when we check you know, with most common exposed chemicals, about 10 to 15% of the population had those antibodies. And, you know, 85%, 90% didn't have them. But there's a subset of people that, that had these new antibodies developed from chemical exposure. And then, we'll, then we did some antibody testing in those that had it and those that didn't. And it was a huge risk for developing autoimmune disease if your body is now keeping chemicals in your blood where they change the protein structure. And the study I did was looking at myelin basic protein and myelin oligodendrocytic protein, which are target proteins for MS and other demyelinating diseases. So that was a shock. And that was a whole new model that has never been identified in autoimmune disease development. So that was what my work came in. I think we could talk about that for hours on end, right? That that one little thing. I mean, that, that's so fascinating. And and I'm sure you've you've explored paths of uh, helping people overcome it. I'm curious what that looks like. And I know that wasn't really why I wanted to go with the conversation, but that's so interesting. Yeah, absolutely. We can we can ask it's about so, so moving or you know. Um, so first of all, those levels of chemicals uh, they may not even be high in your blood. Like you could have high amounts of BPA from plastic in your blood or in your urine, or you may have normal levels. And even if you have normal levels, you may have really really high antibodies against those chemicals. So it's not even about the quantity, and it's about how does your immune system react or not react. So fundamentally, I mean, when you look at chemical exposures, we were all getting chemical exposures. And I remember one of the things I saw in my practice. It was just very healthy people, athletes, uh, eating really well, doing all the right things and being really sick. And you always go, why, why would someone like that get really, really sick? And sometimes people get really sick because they get exposed to chemicals and they have chemical load and they have issues with um, having issues where they may not process chemicals very well. And, and it's very frustrating and always for the, for the patient because they're making such an effort to improve the quality of health. And all of a sudden they don't know why they're really sick. They don't know why things are happening. Then there's a you know chemical um, 
part of the chemical toxicity, chemical immune reaction. That's that's part of that. So first of all, is it, can a person clear those chemicals out? So we get chemicals in our body all the time, but we can biotransform them. Like whether we get we're exposed to fire retardants or plastics or liver can clear those out. And that's, you know, we, we, it's biotransformation. People call it detox. And then people think detox is weird. So, you know, the real word is biotransformation. That's These it. chemicals go through phase one, phase two, and then we metabolize them out. And if you can't do that, and if that's a parrot, then that allows them to circulate in the blood longer. So this is like one variable that may be a factor. We don't we don't have extensive research on all the variables yet. And then secondly, if they, if they start to bind to proteins, they may or may not trigger an immune response. And there's a mechanism in immunology called immune tolerance. And all of us have some degree of immune tolerance. Immune tolerance means our immune system's ability to react or not react to food proteins or to chemicals or to ourself. So when people, for example, develop an autoimmune disease, they for sure have lost their tolerance and they're attacking their own body. So self, they've lost self-tolerance. But you can you know, also develop loss of tolerance to food protein, dietary protein. That's when people start to get sensitive to like gluten, dairy, and soy, and all those foods down, down that path. And then you can also lose your chemical tolerance. Your body starts to make antibodies to chemicals because it can't dampen that immune part of it. It's not tolerant to it anymore. And that triggers an immune response. And usually when you start to lose one, you lose the other. So a typical scenario is like someone for some reason gets sick, they then start to react to a bunch of foods, they get chronic inflammation, they start reacting to chemicals, they may even know they're reacting to chemicals. Next thing you know, they have MS or even, even worse, maybe they don't even know they have an autoimmune disease like my family member for many, many years. And then they, they walk around confused from one healthcare practitioner to the next, to the next, to the next, and just completely frustrated. So what seems to be the primary trigger, right? It, it, like, is there, is there some commonalities you're seeing amongst all these patients you're seeing that seems to be the, the kind of the precipice, the initial event? No, hmm. it's multivariate. That's why it's so hard. Mm-hmm. You know, like just say it's one thing and it's uh, I mean, it's a combination of things, right? It's a combination of like, it's a perfect storm. There's definitely in, in the world of losing tolerance and autoimmune immunology, some gene susceptibility, but not one gene like multiple genes that all have a size effect, right? A small, small effect, mm-hmm. small effect size, multiple genes with a small effect size in combination with the perfect storm of maybe having some loss of intestinal permeability, some exaggeration of the immune response, some stress, some lack of sleep. The thing causes epigenetic effects. Some genes turn on for autoimmunity. Maybe it's an overactive T-cell autoimmune response. Maybe it's an overactive B-cell autoimmune response. Maybe it's an elevated cytokine production from a macrophage autoimmune response. So there's all these different immune mechanisms of autoimmunity. Any one of those can turn on. And then for some reason, no one understands yet is why certain target proteins would be would be the target site versus others. And why some people have three or four. And 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 uh, that's, that's an area where I think everyone is trying to figure this out in the world of autoimmune immunology research. It's fascinating. So I'd like to just kind of start walking through the the little, you know, in my brain, I kind of put them in, I, carp- I compartmentalize for simplicity's sake. And so if we start looking at the, you know, call it the autonomic nervous system and its influence on uh, autoimmunity, right? So obviously we're, we're constantly bombarded with stresses. And I'm curious if you could just walk us down the path of, you know, maybe a little bit of, of understanding around how that's implicated into autoimmunity specifically. Sure. I mean, for sure, stress physiology is going to impact the immune system and, and potentially be one of the variables that adds to the load turning on autoimmune disease and even be a, a key mechanism where someone gets a flare up, you know, because once you have autoimmune, you're constantly feeling with relapse and remission and so forth. But the stress response and the stress response can be dictated by many things. It could be your psychological stress. It could be someone who's got like a vestibular apathy, vestibular disorder, and movement and motion causes a stress response. It could be someone who had a traumatic brain injury. Their glial cells are injured or prime and active and they have neuroinflammation and their uh, modulating uh, pathways in the brain can't work as effectively. So they get things like dysautonomia and they get an exaggerated stress response. But stress responses are really just like life is hard. And I have a lot of stress, right? Okay. Stress responses many times are just physiological. It's little, little small triggers can cause them based on what the mechanisms are that damn right. autonomic response. So, but if for some people it is, sometimes people get into a lot of load and they maybe overtrain or they, um, 
overwork or not get enough rest. They don't have the strep adaptation pathway and all these variables. But stress responses are going to do a few things. First thing they're going to, when you look at the stress response, there's a sympathetic uh, autonomic response and an endocrine response. So the sympathetic autonomic response is the stress response is going to ag- activate areas, mesencephalic reticular formation that's going to activate areas in the sympathetic chain, to the intermunal assault called. You're going to get all these catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine released, and that's going to completely uh, cause T cell dysfunction. So as epinephrine or epinephrine levels go up, you start to get some degree of T cells, T cell dysfunction, heart rate levels go up. And then those are the going to be the initial immune responses to stress. And then the hypothalamus pituitary general axis kicks in and cortisol gets put out. And then cortisol just literally breaks down the barriers. You've got the gut barrier breaks down, the lung barrier breaks down, the nasopharynx barrier breaks down, the blood brain barrier breaks down. So now environmental exposures can cross into tissues, with, which they're not designed to do, causing an exaggerated immune response. And both cortisol and, and, uh, and epinephrine from the stress response, they dysregulate, activate regulatory T cells, which is the key cell that stops from autoimmune disease to develop. And the combination of the barriers being dysfunctional and T cells being dysfunctional and, and um, uh, just overall immune dysregulation takes us from stress is a key factor in autoimmune disease. And in animal models, they can turn on autoimmune disease by culture. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm curious if, um, you know, when looking at someone's autonomic response, um, you know, what are, what are some of the key things that happen that maybe are unusual? So, you know, typical, when I, when I think of like autonomic response, like you said, we're thinking about physiological, psychological, chemical stresses that are all happening. And, you know, sometimes we, we, we think we're aware of all of our stresses, but I'm curious what you're seeing on autoimmune patients that are, you kind of mentioned like some glial cell things, like what are the internal things that maybe people aren't aware of? That's just an area of interest for me. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the dysautonomia for a second. So dysautonomia mm-hmm. is really common. And, uh, you know, for, can, you, can you define that? Yeah. Yep. This being dysfunctional autonomia, being the autonomic nervous system control. And, and for, for people that may not be familiar with autonomic nervous system, there's a sympathetic fight or flight, which gets your heart rate up and dilates your pupils. as a parasympathetic, which calms everything down and allows you to digest and swallow and so forth. So dysautonomia means they're not working at the right times. They're mm-hmm. working at different times. And the biggest clue of dysautonomia is just to measure your heart rate. And if you see heart rate variability all over the place, that's a sign like your autonomic nervous system is not working the way it should. The other key thing you know, people will notice when they have dysautonomia is their pupils will be dilated. And a lot of times people say, hey, well, your eyes are so dilated. What's happening? You know, they sometimes think they're on drugs or things like that. Mm-hmm. And also, when their eyes dilate, they're extremely sensitive to, to light. So they get like, sensitive to light. Then they, get pal- they, they feel their heart rate going like crazy. They're, if they measure their heart rate, they're, all, they're off the chart. And those types of dysautonomias, I mean, the most common cause of that, it actually is a past brain injury, mm. past head injury. And uh, sometimes these things don't show up two years later. So I know with like many people that had a head trauma at one point, um, what the research is showing is that these cells in the brain called glial cells, they get primed. And uh, what that means is they're, they normally microglial cells or immune cells, they kind of walk around the brain and they get rid of debris and unhealthy neurons and clean up room for synapses. But when they get significant injury or impact to the brain, these glial cells stop moving. They change into what's called an ambient structure. And they start releasing all these inflammatory mediators, mediators and they're hypersensitive to any kind of systemic inflammation. So another cl- clue, like if someone has this autonomia with prime glial cells is Let's say they get exposed to food they're sensitive to. Let's say it's milk protein or uh, something like that, whey protein, egg protein, stuff like that, the common ones. And then for them, it's not that they just get bloated. It's like the brain function goes down. So they completely lose uh, their cognitive abilities or some even get like tinnitus or some get vertigo. It's like a disproportional response. And and for other people, it could be that they're they're sensitive to an an air pollutant or or allergies or maybe they have mold sensitivity and they get into a damp building and those things get triggered. But that's what happens when people get prime glial cells. So then those are second. So that's, and over time, they get more and more expressed. So if anyone's ever had a head injury, and especially if they've lost consciousness, there's a very high, there's a likely, there's a strong likeliness you may have some of those cells become primed. And then these prime glial cells, is kind of like a forest fire. They, they surge out inflammatory cytokine, inflammatory mediators that then kind of go all throughout the brain. And then when you look at the autonomic control of the brain, it's in multiple regions of the brain that then fire into the brainstem. But once people start to have a greater expression of brain inflammation, one of the things that 
usually shows up as this dysautonomia pattern, right? So you can see someone that gets a, a, a head injury while they're playing sports or doing something, maybe a car accident or something years later. Over time, these prongylial cells get more and more active. The brain gets more and more inflamed. They start to then get dysautonomia. Their digestion doesn't work very well. Their heart is all over the place. They have dilated pupils. They check their blood pressure. Sometimes they think it's the machine's broken, but it's not. And then they can have autoimmune disease turn on, like we talked about mm -hmm. earlier. And then that's a vicious cycle. So that, that happens a lot. And those are patients that are missed all the time. And I know you work a lot with athletes and probably have a lot of very high level athletes. In this. And, and as you know, some of them are very, very sick. And sometimes it's like a past head trauma that never got put into the factory. Because the old way of thinking of brain trauma is like you hit your head and you go, okay, are you better now? <laughs> like I'm dizzy. Well, right. three days later, you're not dizzy anymore. Well, you must be okay. So this is, this is the, that whole kind of, I guess, loop of uh, prime glial cells, dysautonomia, autoimmunity, stress response. Yeah, so interesting. And I know a lot of athletes tend to have this learned helplessness, right? They're like, it's just, it's just part of who I am now. It's just like, you know, they get into these depressive states and it almost yep. feels like, um, you know, I mean, I, I don't know a lot about depression, but it feels like, you know, it's obviously probably some semblance of depression and uh, they just, it's almost like they feel like they're not themselves anymore. They feel like their yep. brains just don't work the same. Their emotional control isn't the same. Their stress responses aren't the same. And, you know, I see a lot of these ex-NFLers ending their life or ex-military guys ending their life. I could imagine that that's probably highly correlated. Yeah, they're all highly correlated. And uh, what happens is these once these glial cells turn on and get more and more inflamed over time, and they do postmortem studies in different conditions that have glial cell activation, like autism has glial cell activation, so they get more active and more active every decade, and they get worse and worse. And this is part of the you know post uh, uh, traumatic, traumatic brain injury encephalopathy, right? Uh, and uh, when they get inflammation in the brain, they're nerve conductance speed goes down. So when your nerve conductance speed goes down, then you can't, then you can't really function at the level you used to function. So focus, concentration, mental alertness, those types, even, even reflexes, who are doing movements and motions, they all become apparent because there's inflammation in the brain. And when you look at the studies done on depression in recent years, it's, everything's kind of moved away from like the neurotransmitter deficiency model. Like you need serotonin, you need dopamine. Mm -hmm. and finding that the inflammatory model of depression is really the, more, the most likely mechanism for many of these non-responsive depression people, they call them MDDs, major depressive disorders. So they do get depression, they get inflammation, their brain doesn't focus well, they constantly get complaining of brain fog, the mood changes, they get autonomia, auto dysautonomia, this, these dysautonomias then change their gut. Now they have food sensitivities, now they can never fix their gut and then what supplements they take. And, and they're really stuck in this, this really chronic pattern. And it's very frustrating for them, of course. Yeah. So neuroinflammation is an area that you seem to have been focused or be, you are focused on a lot lately. And I'm curious uh, what that looks like as far as, uh, you know, treatment modalities that exist, what the current scope of research looks like, and just kind of give us a lay of the land for what's going on with neural inflammation. So one of the biggest, uh, biggest concepts, the most important concept about that is, is once these glial cells get activated, they stay activated and they turn on for the rest of someone's life. Oh, wow. And they just stay there. Yeah. Okay. The only chance you have to get rid of them is if you promote autophagy. And as, as most people know, as you know, most ways from autophagy is to do fasting. No. <laughs> fasting. So intermittent fasting may be one of the most important things for them. And then the other thing is uh, what they find is that ketosis being in the state of uh, ketosis, ketone bodies not only provide fuel for the brain, but they're actually anti-inflammatory. And ketones actually dampen microglial activation. So they turn these microglial cells, what's called M2 pro M1 pro-inflammatory to an M2 anti-inflammatory state. So from a dietary perspective, the people that are in this vicious cycle, they just do better as soon as they get into ketosis and they start using ketones, the brain inflammation starts to go down. And then as they can go from ketosis to even fasting, they can start promoting autophagy and they can start getting rid of some of these prime glial cells. So is that exogenous ketones as well as endogenous? Obviously endogenous makes sense, but exogenous supplementation does work as well? It absolutely works as well. The studies have only been done with diet, but in a clinical setting, it does, does have an impact. The problem is these microglial cells are extremely activated by insulin. So insulin turns them on. That's one of the other benefits of the ketogenic diet is that their insulin levels go down. So if they're taking exogenous ketones, but then they eat a meal and get a huge insulin surge, then they may not even notice 
they might have a yo-yo effect. You might not really notice it, but definitely notice it if they're, they're actually in ketosis with lower insulin levels. Yeah. So that's another part of uh, having these you know, brain injuries or auto dysautonomias and so forth uh, from brain injury is you really want to, um, you know, really consider controlling your insulin, even if you don't fully go into ketosis, but having insulin spikes, the you know, most obvious line is fatigue after meals would be like an insulin spike. Um, that, that can really continue to aggravate the brain and cause more depression and dysautonomia and, and then eventually turn into autoimmune disease. Yeah. I've got a friend, a couple of friends actually that are professional boxers and they've, they've started uh, hearing some research around red light therapy, Sean, directly on the brain to actually de- decrease neural inflammation. Is that something you've ever experienced or, or heard of? I haven't heard of it, but it's very fascinating. I mean, <laughs> the problem is you can't read, keep, up, keep up with everything. So yeah. every time I talk to people like you, I always learn something. <laughs> so we have people that are highly intelligent and uh, communicate with a lot of people. So I'll look into that. But thank you. Yeah. I mean, it seems interesting. And, and uh, you know, there's, I think there's some research on it. There's some, uh, actually, Dr. Anthony J, who's a previous guest on the on the podcast, is somebody suggested it to us because we were working with so many boxers. And you can imagine after a fight, whether it be UFC or a boxer, there's a lot of brain stuff going on. So we're trying to save these guys from like exactly what you're talking about, right? This long-term, uh, you know, depressive like state. Yeah. And that's the thing is you would hope uh, things like the UFC, com- institutions like the UFC and, and boxing communities would start to really implement lifestyle change and support for them before the fight. And the other thing to remember is when you look at like boxers, it's not how hard you hit your head or how hard the injury was. It's how, how these cells were primed before your injury to your head. So if you have someone who, and we know this like post-concussive syndrome, right? Like someone gets one injury, the second one is much, much worse. It doesn't always have to be a head trauma. Like if you have lots of insulin and you have lots of inflammation and your blood brain barrier is breached, your pre-existing glial cells are already firing at a higher rate. Now you could get a small hit to the head and have significant consequences from it. So we always kind of think of the variable what determines the traumatic brain injury is how hard they were hit, but it's not. So one of the key variables of uh, traumatic injury having an effect is um, how primed these glial cells or activated these glial cell inflammatory pathways were before the trauma. And that's what gets really scary. Is this something you can test? Are you currently testing your, your facility? I, I, it's not it's not a research that I do, but it's been published. So, the, so this is really under what they call M1, M2 expression. So these glial cells have a pro-inflammatory state that's M1, an anti-inflammatory state called M2. And, you know, most of our brain are glial cells, not neurons. More than half our weight are actually immune cells in the brain. But these glial cells can be activated through various lifestyle things. Like insulin will turn on M1 pathways. Uh, Cigarette smoking will turn on M1 pathways. Being around free radicals, uh, having any kind of oxidative stress, having a systemic infection will turn on these M1 pathways. And they get more and more expressed. And then things that turn on the M2 pathways would be rest, sleep, exercise, anti-inflammatory flavonoids. Um, Those all shift. So we're all kind of balancing our M1, M2 microglial pathways. And some of us have really, really high M1. Some of us have balanced out levels and have really anti-inflammatory effects in the brain. The ones that are really in the M1 state, um, they get an injury to the brain or get a trauma to the brain. It is completely different. So it's a game changer. So this is something we could physically test. Is that through blood or, or what type of test would that be? Like cerebral spinal fluid? No, unfortunately we don't have M1, M2 markers. It wouldn't okay. It would, it would be, they're all being done in a research setting, not in a commercial clinical setting yet, but, uh, you know, so you mentioned, uh, anti-inflammatory poly, uh, polyflavonoids, I think you said bioflavonoids, uh, any specific substances that, so like my brain wants to understand, like, what are the action items we can take? So we got ketosis. That's a great one. Exercise, sleep. Those are great. Is there anything else that goes on that list for people who are ultimately, I mean, I think, I think all of us at some level, Dr. Krasin, are trying to optimize brain function so that we don't end up, you know, not functioning well in our nineties and and beyond. So anything else that comes up? I can give you the list. Uh, so let's start with flavonoids. Uh, flavonoids, the ones that matter are the ones that can cross the blood brain barrier. So the interesting thing about flavonoids are flavonoids, if you, flavonoids being, you know, the colorful anti-inflammatory compounds in foods, right? So um, r- grapes like a uh, resveratrol, turmeric, you know, those are great, great, let's say uh, flavonoids. This was like with a lot of research, but any, any kind of uh, like uh green tea flavonoid or orange peel flavonoid or grape seed extract, you know, all these things have flavonoids. I think that's color in it, right? Pomegranate extract has lots of flavonoids in there. But any of these flavonoids, what they do is they 
first of all, don't work until the microbiome metabolizes into secondary products. So that's one very interesting thing that I think people should understand about flavonoids. If five different people take flavonoids, not all of them are going to have the same effect. So flavonoids uh, get metabolized by gut bacteria into active secondary compounds. So like, for example, soy flavonoids is an area where they've done a lot of research with. And like soy, like genistein and diadazine, which are compounds from soy, they have no effect on any receptor sites at all in that form. They get metabolized by gut bacteria to um, different types of isoflavones. And then they can then impact like estrogen receptor sites and have a selective estrogen receptor modulating effect and so forth. But it works the same with any other one. So when people have lack of microbiome diversity and don't have a diverse gut with a lot of healthy bacteria, they may take flavonoids and have very little anti-inflammatory effects on them because they're not even able to have the bacteria species there to convert them into an active form. So um, that's one thing. But technically, if you keep taking flavonoids, you actually diversify your gut because that'll actually first change your microbiome. Then once your microbiome gets healthy, those, those secondary byproducts can be made and you want flavonoids that can cross the blood brain barrier. So for sure, flavonoids and green tea extract, um, grapeseed extract, and then turmeric and resveratrol all cross the brain brain barrier. And the most research is on turmeric, turmeric and resveratrol. So those compounds directly go and switch uh, glial cells into an M2 anti-inflammatory state. They also heal uh, the blood brain barrier. Good so so initially intermittent fasting and ketogenic diet, using things like resveratrol and turmeric every day would be really good. And then another key thing you can add to that list would be things like ginkgo. Ginkgo and vinpocetine. Ginkgo uh, helps increase nitric oxide, methyl nitric oxide that gets blood flow there. That's necessary to uh, heal the blood brain barrier, which many people have uh, issues with with, contain, con- with this brain injury that sustained, that continues on for years and years and years. So that can be useful. Also increases blood flow to the brain. So ginkgo was you know, really popular in the 80s. And now no one uses it. It's one of the best botanicals for brain health and lots of anti-inflammatory properties. So resveratrol, turmeric, ginkgo, ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting, getting plenty of sleep would be very important for M1 expression. And then physical exercise without over without overtraining helps shift into M1. So and when you really think about it, it's like all the things we all know to do. <laughs> right. But doing it is the next question, right? Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of um, autoimmunity again, I'm curious about, um, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of bringing us back into the gut and I'm curious how all that ties in. So obviously autoimmunity is in one level affected by stress, but you know, if we could, if we could talk a little bit about the gut health uh, component and obviously the microbiome and, and gut permeability um, and, you know, maybe some, some, again, best practices that you would suggest or things maybe people should be avoiding when it comes to optimization of gut health. And I, again, this, this may be kind of simple stuff for you, but I think it takes us down an interesting path. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the, it's really, they call it the decade, but it's really been like 20 years now of the microbiome, but that, you know, the decade of the brain, <laughs> the decade of the microbiome, everyone's studying it and mm-hmm. learning the links between the microbiome and everything from neurodegenerative disease to cardiovascular disease, to mood disorders, to childhood developmental disorders, to everything. And the bottom line is, first of all, the, the microbiome contains bacteria, but these bacteria actually have functions. So these bacteria produce signaling agents and these bacteria produce what are called postbiotics, right? So let me define a few terms for people when they're learning about the gut. So we have bacteria, which is a biotic, right? So then you have a probiotic you may take, and that's like a strain of a bacteria, right? And then you have a prebiotic. Prebiotic is like something that helps you make more ba- your own bacteria, like fiber is a great prebiotic, right? So you have prebiotics, and you can take a probiotic, and then you actually have your microbiome, the, the biotic. So, and then those bacteria make postbiotics. And these postbiotics have a huge impact on our neuroendocrine immune function. And they're being studied more and more all the time. And most of these postbiotics are what are called polysaccharides. So uh, our body, the more bacteria it has, the more potential it is to have these polysaccharides. And when you look at health and disease, you know, the human physiological system is designed in a feed, feedback, feed forward system to always heal itself. Like we're designed to heal ourselves. When someone becomes chronic, something has gone wrong where it can't heal itself. And the more diversity of bacteria we have, the more potential we have to heal ourselves because we have more of these polysaccharides that can be made. So one of the most fascinating postbiotics, meaning a 
uh, compound that that bacteria is made in the world of autoimmune disease is something called polysaccharide A. And polysaccharide A is made by health, healthy gut bacteria. And when they a- inject polysaccharide A in animal models right now, MS models, the autoimmune disease is cured. Like it's gone, like, like it never happened. So that is mind blowing, right? And then we have research for now where they're doing fecal transplants and seeing autoimmune disease and inflammatory conditions change. And you're going, oh, wow, this, this, this microbiome has a huge impact. So one, one thing of the, of, of the gut is that, first of all, the bacteria we have are highly functional and they're, they're making these postbiotic species. The other key thing I think it's important people know when they're learning about the gut and how it relates to their health and autoimmunity is that these gut bacteria have enzymes and these enzymes have different metabolic steps. So some of the bacterial species in our gut are going to convert a flavonoids into an active form. Some of the bacterial species we have in our gut are going to detoxify and help metabolize out fire retardants and BPA. They have either a phase one or phase two uh, detoxification or biotransformation enzyme that helps support that pathway. So our gut actually, just like our liver, helps clear out toxins into a water-soluble way so we can eliminate them through urine, feces, and sweat. So these, these bacteria produce post post uh, uh, biotics like lipopolysaccharides. They have enzymes to help with their metabolic processes, and they uh, have the ability to release hormones and cytokines as messenger proteins and impact the immune system. And what they find is specifically short chain fatty acids, which are these uh, compounds that we use from fiber to help make bacteria, but they also are signaling agents. And things like these are called butyrate propylene acetate. But these compounds can turn on stop brain inflammation. <laughs> they can tap in microglial cells. They communicate with their energy cells called the mitochondria, so they can function more efficiently. So, like when you look at the gut, um, these bacterial species are so important for keeping us in a in a state where we can heal ourselves because they're doing so many metabolic processes. And then when they've studied the human microbiome and they go, well, what's a good gut? What's an unhealthy gut? And what are good probiotics? What are bad bacteria? Really what they're finding is they can't, they can't figure that out, that they're so complex that they didn't have to use machine learning to be able to defer each of these different variables. It won't, it won't be like lactobacillus is fantastic and this one is bad. It's not that linear. It's complex and they have different roles with each other. So they don't, they can't necessarily say what's the good strain or bad strain because they have what's called pluripotentiality, multiple reactions at different times, but they do know diversity was the key factor. So the more diverse the gut is, that was absolutely a clear mechanism, the clear finding of any disease that has been studied so far. So the, so diversity is really the key to having a really healthy uh, microbiome. And when we look at so then you go, okay, well, what causes microbiome diversity? Like, how does this work? And right. what do we do to change it? <laughs> um, and this apply for autoimmune disease. This apply for traumatic brain injury, inflammation. This apply for just general health. Um, so like a third of our microbiome is genetically based. It's the passed down from our parents, from our family, from our gene pool. Okay, so that's our, our genome. The other two third is not. So there are some people who have a genetic difference in their microbiome where they may have bacterial species that uses calories really efficiently and some that do not. And they may have a harder time storing calories. They may have more proneness to how they, how they process energy, right? There are other bacterial species that impacts an immune function and, and so forth and so forth. So, so, so a third of it is, is hard, like your classical genes. The other two thirds is really dependent upon what you do with, with, with your life. So diet, nutrition, lifestyle, hormone shifts, fluctuations. So everything from physical, like physical exercise can change, change to change microbiome diversity, the foods you eat, the more diverse your foods are, um, that can impact microbiome diversity. Uh, and sp- specifically the more plant fibers, different types of plant fibers a person eats, the more, uh, microbiome diversity they get. Um, Sleep has been to impact microbiome diversity. Um, so every, like everything really has an impact on this back by back diversity. And what's interesting is though, sometimes people will just completely even go on a carnivore diet and we see the microbiome diversity change. So we don't understand all of it because it's not as simple as just eat more vegetables and fruits because some people, they stop eating vegetables and fruits and the microbiome completely becomes diverse and their autoimmunity calms down and you get this like paradoxical thing that throws everything you understand about the microbiome out the window. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, a lot of experts um, 
in in the scientific field, say the microbiome, say this will be one of the most important biomarkers in the future is our diversity index. So just like we go in every year to get our blood pressure checked and uh, routine blood work and so forth, they're going to check the microbiome yeah, diversity. So, so in saying that, where do you uh, stand or how do you feel about the current kind of infatuation with hand sanitizer and chlorination and de- detoxification of everything that in our in our society? I think it's it's going it's going to have a significant impact on the microbiome and uh, it, it's that was the first chlorinated action. water, right? Like it's yeah. it's an interesting paradox. So I have some friends who work in a microbiome research lab. And they had a study, they had a contest at one month where they were going to see who would have the most diverse microbiome by the end of the month. <laughs> There's a researchers there. Yeah. Is it nerd, nerd games? I like it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so the ones that were in the like they would check each week to see who's like who's on top, who's winning, and so forth. And it was the ones that stopped showering and washing their hands and. And, really? Uh, yeah, and the microbiome became really off the chart. <laughs> Super healthy. So, um, uh, maybe and that was just done within a thirty-day window that they could see those changes, and even week to week they could see those changes. So, mm-hmm. and this goes back to what's called the hygiene hypothesis, where you're going to get exposed to microbiomes and all so forth. But I think everyone's so scared with the current pandemic and COVID, and they're to be extra cautious. But it's going to have an impact on on the microbiome for sure. Yeah. So if someone's just coming off a round of antibiotics or they know they've, they've been consuming a huge amount of glyphosate or some type of pesticide, um, as far as like first order of, of business to get things repopulated, is it just like take some probiotics, eat the probiotic foods, get outside in nature, do all kind of the best practices and don't shower for a couple of weeks? Well, maybe I don't know about the shower. <laughs> uh, maybe there's some truth to that. Um, I would tell you, that, you know what, more and more over my own clinical practice working with with patients that have autoimmune disease and chronic inflammation, and with the research showing is probiotics are not really as 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 powerful as we think they are. I mean, there's yes. some evidence that they work, but the problem is the probiotic has to also work with the host. So a strain of probiotic with the host, and not just the host always, but a host at that given time will determine if there's actually an effect. Right. So I find it's much more beneficial to just use like fiber, like a fiber supplement, uh, and also to use uh, short chain fatty acids and specifically butyrate. Like if butyrate is phenomenal. Like actually taking a butyrate supplement? Yeah. Like like a ketone supplement? Is it a ketone? Well, it was beta hydroxy butyrate. And right. then you just take uh, like uh, uh, calcium, calcium butyrate. Straight butyrate. Straight yeah. Yeah, butyrate. It doesn't uh, you know, always smell that great. But butyrate, even propionate and acinate can be taken as an nutraceutical supplement. But butyrate being the easiest one to find. But butyrate um, has been shown to impact microbiome diversity dramatically. Mm-hmm. It's the main fuel you're your gut uses and butyrate uh, also uh, is the fuel for the microbiome to, to have fuel itself to develop. And most amazing about butyrate recently in the autoimmune disease world is that butyrate um, actively turns on regulatory T cells. So regulatory T cells are what determines how much inflammation we have throughout our whole body. And butyrate binds what are called G-coupled proteins on these regulatory T cells. And then that has a significant damping inflammation in animals studies, they, they've used it with MS animal models, and they give an ingested oral butyrate, and autoimmune responses in the brain are changing, and systemic inflammation are, are changing. So if you have to use the huge amount of antibiotics, using fiber and maybe exogenous butyrate, uh, I'm sure like uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate exogenous ketones probably have similar effect, but I, I, I would think using sodium butyrate is, uh, I have a researcher study, I think would be more efficient to getting a gut response. I think there's a conversion that takes place that, but that and some fiber, uh, and I don't know about the sharing part, but, but you probably don't want to be overly crazy about how, like using hand sanitizer. Yeah. Um, so drawing a correlation between gut health and autoimmunity now, we didn't quite draw that bridge. And obviously it's, it's like your, your line of defense, but I'm curious how that, you know, if you could draw that bridge for us. And your frontal lobe is excellent, by the way. You're you're really <laughs> staying on track and staying here is it's pretty darn good. Uh, okay, so let's continue. So the microbiome uh, is important. Has all these the things that we need for polysaccharides important to be diverse. That's a key part of autoimmunity. And another key thing is um, well, we talk about loss of immune tolerance. So loss of immune tolerance, where people then start to attack their own body, have reactions to their own foods, and develop autoimmune disease and chronic inflammation. That also has manifestations in the gut. So one of the things is, you know, everyone is, is going to learn more about, which is intestinal permeability, leaky gut. 
So that's when these intestinal tight junctions open up and um, food proteins that are not completely digested can cross. So when you look at a food protein, a food protein is multiple, uh, you know, pop peptides stuck together and those peptides can break down to uh, an amino acid sequence and then eventual amino acids. Well, antibodies can only bind to the peptide. They can't bind to individual amino acids, right? So the, if you can't digest your food well and food proteins cross and all, without being amino acids broken down before they get absorbed, then the immune system goes crazy against that. So that's where leaky gut allows these undigested proteins to cross through the gut membrane. And then beyond the gut membrane, all these cells ready for any intruder, they see those undigested proteins come through and they go crazy and it triggers severe immune response against them. That's intestinal permeability. So when people have intestinal digestion breakdown, or so-called leaky gut, one of the most obvious things I'll first notice is I'm starting to react to food. Like, uh, you know, every time I have dairy or milk or egg or soy or corn being the most common ones, they may feel bloated or the body may start to ache and they get basically inflammation throughout their body or they even get brain fog, they can get depression. But start to see food is starting to cause an inflammatory response with them. So that's that's another thing that's happening in the gut. In the context of that, there's another part of oral tolerance was on top of these gut cells, there are cells called dendritic cells and dendritic cells sample foods. And these have been shown to be dysfunctional and when people lose tolerance and these food, these things that sample food all the time, they become overzealous. They start to have severe inflammatory responses to any food protein that comes in. And they found things like vitamin A imbalances and chronic stress um, really makes these dendritic cells dysfunctional. So now if you have someone who's got a microbiome that's not diverse and they have intestinal permeability, leaky gut, these tight junctions are open and these dendritic cells are overactive, every time they eat, food is going to trigger an inflammatory autoimmune reaction potentially. With so them. any food, not just specific foods in this case. Well, it won't be every food, but some foods will have a, the foods that the immune system starts to make antibodies to will be the ones that will be the biggest culprits. But at some point, if they keep eating the same food, you'll see that response. Like I'll give you an example, working with many, many autoimmune disease patients, I can tell you, we'll do, for example, a I food sensitivity panel on them where we make, we check antibodies, IgG right. IgG antibodies. And they have like, if you have a 200 foods you're checking, 90%, 80% of them show positive. So they start to lose their tolerance. They start to react to every single food over time. And then, or maybe you get a person that let's say reacts to only 20 food. If you take that person and say, I just don't want you to eat these 20 foods anymore. And they change your diet, they retest like four months later, all the new foods they're eating start to show up. Mm. It doesn't matter what they change their diet to. Since the microbiome is no longer diverse, since the dendritic cells are so, so overactive, since their microbiome isn't keeping the anti-inflammatory response there, they start to develop sensitivities to foods that they constantly get exposed to. Now, certain foods tend to be more antigenic, uh, meaning they trigger their immune response further. Gluten, dairy, soy, egg, uh, whey are the, really the most common ones. Um, so let's go down the path of gluten, dairy, uh, okay. and w eggs and whey, because we hear that a lot, right? And sometimes people get in this like very myopic stance of like, don't eat these things. They're going to cause autoimmunity. They're going to cause brain fog. They're going to cause leaky gut. Is that true? And if you could clarify that, that kind of entire area for us. Yeah. So yes, there's some truth to it, but there's also some caution with that too, because what happens is, well, first of all, if you're, you can take the guesswork out by just measuring antibodies in your blood. You can get an uh, antibody test and see what specific foods you're showing immune reaction to. But it's very, very common. Let's say if we stick with autoimmune disease for a while, with autoimmune disease, uh, people suffering from autoimmune disease, that they will react to gluten and dairy uh, more so than the other food protein. And that's not just theory anymore. That's published in the literature in, in multiple publications. So gluten and dairy, for whatever reason, uh, are very immune reactive and people will react to those. So what will happen is a person will become gluten dairy free and maybe they have an autoimmune disease and they actually follow a gluten dairy free diet. And maybe you're like, they go, Oh my God, I feel better. Then they go, okay, what's the next food? And they spend their whole life looking for the next food, next food. And pretty soon the amount of foods they're eating is narrowed down. And now they're having like the same salad every day, the same lunch every day. They're not really having diversity in their diet. So now their microbiome starts to shrink. And then the, when I say microbiome, the microbiome diversity starts to shrink because now they're on limited foods. And now because they're on limited foods, their uh, microbiome is not diverse. And their autoimmunity gets worse. 
So now they're going, I don't know what else to cut out. I've cut out every single food and my autoimmunity is worse than ever. Initially, when I went out gluten dairy, it was an issue. It was an issue. Now, if they get exposed to gluten dairy, even, even in this state, they get even worse than before. So it can really go the wrong way. So you really want to be careful getting super extreme with removing every single food protein. Also, like if you have a, like I was telling you an example, we have a person who tests for 90% of foods that has an autoimmune disease when they do food allergy tests, food sensitivity tests, I should say, not allergy, but food sensitivity tests. Um, if you remove all those foods, there's going to be some problems. You have to remove the ones that are really causing like symptoms that are obvious. But gluten and dairy and whey and egg can cause food react, can cause inflammatory reactions. But they're not all. There's also another key factor on top of that, which I think we should really talk about really quickly, which is what's called cross reactivity. So there's a phenomenon called molecular mimicry or cross reactivity, where you make an antibody against the food protein, and that antibody against that food protein binds to your own human tissue because the structure of the food protein amino acid sequence is similar to your body's own amino acid sequence. So for example, gluten has an amino acid sequence similar to structures in the brain, specifically in the cerebellum region of the brain. So for some people, they eat gluten and they make antibodies, and especially if the blood brain barrier is breached, those antibodies against gluten can cross the brain and then cause inflammation in the brain. And that's a cross-reactive response. So you can have one person that has gluten sensitivity and the blood brain barrier is intact and they don't notice anything. And someone else has gluten sensitivity and they have a, you know, leaky gut, leaky blood brain barrier, and they have significant brain inflammation, fatigue when they get exposed. So there's going to be different degrees of reactions to those foods, but food proteins for sure have a role to play. Actually, we're finishing up a study now. We looked at uh, almost 500 subjects that had uh, diagnosed autoimmune disease and looked at leaky guts, intestinal permeability, we're looking at something called zonulin and not gluten. So you can have autoimmune disease turn up and uh, there's definitely a clear difference. If you have leaky gut, whether you develop autoimmune antibodies or not. So it's, it is a real, real factor. And then those people have very high correlation with food sensitivity, gluten, dairy being the most common. So what are you prescribing to heal the um, gut wall? Well, uh, Back to butyrate. <laughs> butyrate. Uh, butyrate actually is probably the most powerful thing that people are using. Everyone's using like mm -hmm. glutamine as a common source, but butyrate has actually been shown in uh, I believe four studies now to cause the tight junction proteins to heal. So when mm -hmm. you have leaky gut, you know, the, there's proteins that keep them together, like the uh, occludin proteins, and those occludin proteins actually get synthesized in animal studies when they give them butyrate. So um, Fiber and butyrate and glutamine would be really good to heal the gut barrier. Vitamin A is good to dampen the dendritic cell responses. Vitamin D is really critical for regulatory T cell responses. So if they can go on, let's say, if, so if, you, if, you, if you're both trying to fix a leaky gut and calm inflammation down the gut, then really going on a grain-free diet altogether, uh, right? Grain-free, lots of diverse vegetables, healthy animal proteins, and then taking things like glutamine and short chain fatty acids and vitamin A, that can be a really good strategy. Have you used BPC-157, the peptide? Have you tried that? I personally don't have enough clinical experience with it to comment, mm. but uh, I know some people love to use it. Are, are you yeah, I've heard great things. I'm just curious. You know, you're, you're the kind of, you're the the guy to go to. So I'd be curious if you haven't used it, then I'm going to, I'm going to put it on the no shelf for a while, I think. I, I'm, uh, you know, I work with very sensitive populations. So I have very, uh, very slow to try things new until more and more stuff comes out. Because yeah. we, we work with autoimmunities, let's say a patient, like have patients that have MS, if we go the wrong way, they can end up in a wheelchair for the next three weeks. And it's yeah. like, okay, I don't want to experiment on you. So. Right. So subjectively, I may or may not try it on myself. And, and I do definitely feel like my digestion's improved. It feels like there's less just overall GI distress. And that's obviously very subjective, but yeah. and I know a lot of people have experienced the same and that's oral BPC. And in, in its individualized approaches too, like we can't, we can't stress that how important individualized responses are, you know, so. <laughs> so with respect to the gut wall, is um, glyphosate is a big consideration because there's yeah. a lot of people, you know, preaching that pesticide and glyphosate are ultimately kind of going to be the demise of the human race. Well, yeah, I think there is, uh, there's some concerns about glyphosate, absolutely. And glyphosates can also bind to proteins and change the structure. Um, but that has never been published yet. Uh, but glyphosates basically they they induce leaky gut, 
life of states work by causing intestinal permeability. They, right. Bugs die because they cause leaky gut. And uh, most of the foods that are gluten foods are really rich in glyphosate. So, you know, as you know, a common theory is that glyphosates are actually changing these grains and wheat products to be, to make it more reactive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, I think that's pretty accurate. Very interesting. So uh, how, how this is like going on the side here, how do you exist in life knowing what you know about what exists in our food supply and in our air supply? Like what kind of precautions are you taking to ensure that your, uh, your microbiome is not getting destroyed, your gut is not getting destroyed, and you know, you're not consuming all these massive amounts of toxins your body can't uh, ultimately handle? Right. So first, first thing is I try to reduce my chemical load. So I use glass. No plastic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, everything in our house is plastic and stainless steel. We don't, we don't, we don't want to, we have, not plastic. Yep. We don't use plastics. So right. we, don't want pl we try to eliminate plastics as much as we can altogether. We don't cook in plastics. We don't heat in plastics. Um, I don't know if you can see my floor is wood. I don't, yep. use, car I don't use carpets. I use a yep. wood, I, I use a wood that uh, isn't treated with chemicals. It's just treated with oil. So we've limited all carpet in our house. I have uh, um, a material like tight woven seal. So I don't have any fire retardant mattress. I've purchased a fire retardant mattress. Most of the furniture is like it. I upholster myself because I don't want any fire retardants on them. Really? I am and then take it out and get reupholstered. So just for my floor off, not, not off gassing, I'm not getting exposed to plastics. I'm using glass. Then I'm already dramatically changing my chemical load, right? Obviously, simple things of like trying to buy organic foods and trying to read labels and looking, make sure you're clean product, cleaning uh, shampoo and, and toothpaste and all that don't have parabens and you know those unhealthy chemicals. So that's number one. This is you know what I try to do with patients that are suffering from chronic inflammation on disease, but that's really important not just for autoimmune disease, but for dementia and cognitive decline, like your environmental system can be impacted. Uh, the other key thing is you have to have a house with a HIPAA filter in each room, or at least a system that's as cool to have a HIPAA filter in your air conditioning or air vent system. Air pollution is a huge trigger. And numerous studies continue to get published on its uh, activation of uh, neuroinflammation in the brain and leading to dementia and cognitive decline. So these inflammatory pollutants actually go up our nose and activate our olfactory bulb and then turn on glial cells and cause inflammation throughout the entire brain. It's not even mm. through lungs, it's through a nasal pathway. So having a HIPAA filter, and it has to be a hot, that, that great of quality of filter. Which one do you use? Do you have a suggested brand? I mean, the one I have in my home is called Rabbit. Okay. As long as H E P A, you know, filter. I remember those like sharper images filters that were. Yeah. They didn't. Yeah. They didn't want HIPAA filters. They, they're not the ones to use, but you want to okay. use the actual HIPAA filter ones. Okay. And then, so air quality and reduce your chemical load in your home would be really good suggestions. Um, and then you really want to try to have um, diversity of different vegetables of all different types in your diet. So one of the things um, I teach my patients to do and I've done in our household and my wife has done is we'll get like uh, 30 different vegetables We'll, we'll go to Whole Foods and get all as many organic vegetables, radishes and spinach and turnips and everything we can get. We put 30 of them in a food processor, mix them all up. We call it a veggie mashup. Oh. And we freeze that. So now I have 30 different vegetables in a bottle. Hmm. And we make like, well, that'll last for a while. We'll freeze that. And then we'll take one out at, you know, each week from the fridge, put a couple of teaspoons in water and drink that. So now I'm getting 30 different diverse fiber exposures. <laughs> so are you, are you liquefying it or just turning it into like a, like a paste? No, like or... Putting it into a spoon. Like when you do a food processor, it just grinds it into. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, I don't know, salad, like typically. Or salad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So almost like cauliflower rice, just with dirty yeah. vegetables. Yeah. And it's like dirt. You just put some in some water and you just get it down. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> but then you get a diverse. So then, so now we're impacting our diversity that way. And mm. then, I have a daughter, she's 16, and she's been following this regimen since she, she could swallow and eat food. But uh, then we do a resvert, we do liquid resveratrol, liquid turmeric, and liquid glutathione every single morning. Those are there just because they're very powerful anti inflammatory. What brand is that? Is this liquid resveratrol? I've never seen that. I use the brand from a company called Apex Energetics. Okay, yep. 
Mm. Yeah, the resveroactive, tameroactive, and trisomal glutathione um, that are fantastic. I financially disclosure, I, I consult with them. So, mm -hmm. uh, but anyways, those are the ones I use. Uh, and then uh, we take a mixture of fatty acids. So olive oil, uh, fish oil, flaxseed oil, gamma lake acid. So diversity of different prostaglandins and the flavonoids and then a microbiome diversity and decreased chemical load and then having poor healthy air quality and no fire retardants in the furniture is like that's that's what i've been doing and uh, hopefully it, you know slows down my degeneration in my i think that's not uh, unreasonable right like i think all the things you mentioned there to the listener I think it's not unreasonable to say, like, get rid of your carpet. I mean, the one thing that maybe most people are like, yeah, right, is like re reupholstering your your, uh, your yeah. sofa. Most people aren't able or willing to do that. But I think everything else is pretty reasonable. And certainly finding a, a, a mattress that doesn't have fire retardants yeah. would be a really, really good recommendation. You can also find uh, manufacturers that don't spray fire furniture, too. Yeah, so the one I have. So yeah. I, I'm associated with uh, Essentia mattress. Have you heard of my Essentia? No. They're, they're fantastic. They're they're all 100 percent organic. It's they're they're the best one I found. I've done a lot of research. I actually designed a bed probably five nice. years ago. Really? Yeah, I did a performance mattress, um, okay. and it saw in the company. But it was um, yeah. So I did tons of research. So the yeah. best one I found is is Essentia, and uh, just I mean 100 percent organic. No no binders. No no petroleum's. It's it's just okay. it's a heck of a mattress. Can you spell it? E S S E N T I A. Okay, Essentia. All right, I'm going to look yeah, at it. So it's myessentia.com. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so this yeah. is what you need to know about. So, yeah, it's great. These, these are all key things, yeah. Yeah, those are the best. And so uh, a little bit more, I want to kind of dig into your brain here a bit. So can you describe what functional neurology is? Yes, functional neurology is, is looking, is basically doing a conventional neurological exam and looking for what are called soft neurological signs. And they could be hard, hard, neurological. hard neurological sign is like uh, you, it's, you have a person close their eyes and they fall. And that's positive Romberg's test. And a soft neurological sign, they close their eyes and they just sway to one side, but they don't necessarily fall. So it's like, it's not black and white, it's the shade of gray. Mm -hmm. So um, in a functional neurology model, what happens is you do a neurological exam, which you're looking for what are called soft signs. And soft signs is the term that's used in conventional neurology too. Uh, so. When you do an online exam, you see hard signs, very clear. This is abnormal and some soft signs where I'm not really sure if this is abnormal. It could be the people response could be a little bit sluggish versus like not responsive at all. Right. So hard versus soft. So conventional neurology really is concerned with um, hard signs and looking for a disease and pathology and determining if they need to get an MRI, if there's something, something has happened like a space occupying lesion in the brain or vascular injury to the brain. Whereas functional neurology is really focused on most people that would that would have an abnormal functional neurology exam would have a would have a normal neurological exam with hard signs. There's no hard sign, right? So if you take let's say an athlete or someone who's starting to have early neurocognitive signs, early Parkinson's, they may not have very clear hard signs, but they may start to show a lot of soft signs, which is that gray area. So functional neurology will go through to an exam and look for as many soft signs and then start to like put them together is what, what part of the brain may be causing these. And there's a phenomenon in neurology called triangulation. You try to figure out where all these different clinical signs start to triangulate. And then you go, okay, this part of the brain may not work well. So maybe it's a person whose balance is off on one side, they can fall and close to go to the left. Maybe when you check their hand coordination, it's just much slower on one side. Those are all, let's both those are cerebellar abnormal findings. That means the area of the brain called the cerebellum is involved with coordinating muscles stringing off. It's, it's involved with balance. And then you go, okay, this left cerebellum is not necessarily working as well. So then you would do exercises to activate that area. <laughs> And it might be like turning to the left because then I'll activate that left vestibular system. You don't want them to turn to the right because I like the right. So maybe you look at their workstation and see that, oh, they're going the wrong way all day. <laughs> or maybe they need to put their screen on a certain area or move some movements. So once you find soft neurological signs, which will always show up with like neurodevelopmental disorders with kids that are still having the brain develop or people just start brain stretch to, to uh, neurodegenerate or as people start to develop neurogenerative disease, those findings in the brain will start showing up in an exam, right? And it's just a little more subtle. So functional will try to find those subtle things and then, then try to activate those areas of the brain with various exercises. It could be balance exercises. It could be eye movements that activate the regions of the brain. It could be smelling things to activate the olfactory pathway. Um, so that's, that's what functional neurology is. It's trying to figure out where there's lack of function and then trying to activate the brain 
to stimulate function. So you're currently teaching people functional neurology, or at least it's part of your, your educational system. You're, yeah. you're, you're an expert and, and probably a top expert in the world on autoimmunity, brain inflammation, neural inflammation. Where's, where's the triangulation amongst all of these? Like, where, So where do you spend most of your time and what's most interesting for you right now? So what I've learned is my whole life I've been trying to treat my family member hmm. that had a brain autoimmunity. So I got interested in neurology and uh, brain and immune, not even knowing that that was what was happening. And then once you walk in that circle and you make yourself available for people looking healthy, you start to attract those types of people suffering that want some guidance, right? Like they had neurological autoimmunity and they don't know what to do. And, and that would require them to calm down their autoimmunity through a dietitian lifestyle and then try to rehabilitate their brain. So over the years, um, you know, like when you treat one patient with a specific disease, they all have friends with specific disease. And then pretty soon you get a room of people. So I've worked with a lot of neurological autoimmune disease um, patients. I've worked with a lot of traumatic brain injury patients just because it's an area that I've spent a lot of time with. And when you spend a lot of time in an area, you get, you get clinical experience and then you get referrals from similar people suffering because they know each other and they communicate or other practitioners that just go, Hey, this is the guy to go to if you see this. And um, they, they all work together. And really there's a neuroendocrine immune function <laughs> that we all have, right? The main signaling pathways are there. So, um, and then I, I think for me, the passion is I don't really have, I don't really have a perfect topic. I don't have a favorite topic. I just have a person in front of me that's suffering. And then I try to go, what, what could I do to help them? And then I realized I've got to learn neurology really well, like for soft science, and I've really got to learn how the immune system functions. I, I got to learn about the microbiome. You know, if, if everyone had, I don't know, earwax issues causing health problems, I probably would spend a lot of time learning about earwax issues. <laughs> it's a, it is whatever drives you. Right? Do you think we'll ever heal autoimmunity? It sounded like you you mentioned something in there that was was effectively either turning it off or, or healing. I don't know if it was in animal models, but do you think that's something we can ever heal? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Um, I think so. And I think it's good. It's good. You know, as much as I would hate to say this, because it, it, it's going to involve some pharmacology. Uh, really? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, that nutrition lifestyle is going to be huge parts of it, but you can't really cure. You can put in remission. So I think as they, as they develop some drugs, to, once they turn on how to turn on the T-Reg, but the problem is, okay, fine. They figure out how to come on autoimmunity, but what are the adverse effects of that? Right, so maybe yeah. they're going to come out immunity. Now you you develop hypersensitivity pain syndrome from that mechanism. So it'll be like every other drug. There might be some side effects. So from a drug model, I'm pretty sure that that will probably happen because they're going to be looking at a single agent. Um, as far as human population, like if we did nothing, autoimmune disease is going to continue to rise just like it is now. And conditions that even not known to be autoimmune, like autism, is really autoimmunity. Uh, they're developed. You know, mothers have fetal brain antibodies during pregnancy, during development. There's already autoimmunity happening before the child's even born. Um, look at the rates of MS. We look at the rates of hypothyroidism, which is really Hashimoto's. We look at the rates of they call uh, late onset autoimmune diabetes adulthood, where adults start to get type one diabetes. Those are all going up. They're and they're and they're there's no trend backwards. And that's, that's going to continue. Now, why? Maybe it's a combination of glyphosates and stress and environmental pollutants and all the inflammatory mechanisms that we have and hyper, hyper hygiene and <laughs> lack of movement. All those things all combined is adding to the perfect storm where more of the population is going to head that way. And But there are people like uh, Fasano. He's at Mass General Hospital. Uh, where, I, where I was uh, doing my research at. And he was, uh, they, they developed this ZOT1 zonulin blocker. And in animal studies, they've never heal leaky gut for people that, for animals with celiac disease. That's going to be a big breakthrough drug for people that have celiac disease. They're not going to, they're not going to develop severe leaky gut patterns when they get accidental exposure to gluten. And they may actually heal their gut with a uh, uh, zonulin uh, blocking agent. Then there's new drugs that are impacting the expression of regulatory T cells and opioid effects there, and they're showing to have an impact. They may even purify postbiotics like polysaccharide A, which you're doing, which may completely turn, <laughs> turn off autoimmunity. So I, I think we might be heading there with drugs. I think we're going to have some side effects with whatever mechanism they have. I don't think we're going to be able to cure it with that nutrition lifestyle alone. 
And I think there's too many variables that's causing the expression of this, but uh, we can certainly put in a remission and function at the higher level if we can find those individual factors. One thing I, we didn't talk about that I'm curious about is the implication of, of heavy metals on uh, autoimmunity and uh, maybe um, yeah. brain health. So, you know, heavy metals is one of these things where you can have, uh, it's, it's gotten weight, it's, it's, uh, it's without question a factor, like heavy metals are toxic to the body. There's no, there's no argument about that. If you take 100 people and measure heavy metals, you're going to have 100 positive heavy metal tests. So we all have some degree of heavy metals in our bodies. And then the question to ask is, well, why do some people develop an illness and some people don't develop an illness? It's just like everything else. There's one variable which you need other variables to have, a, have an issue. So, so we, all, we all have some degree of a physiological tissue toxic load of various chemicals. And some people have very, very high toxic loads in their tissues, but don't all have any illnesses. And maybe their antioxidant status, maybe their immune tolerance status, and all those things are preventing that from happening, right? Mm-hmm. Um, other times people have like heavy metal load and they've had it when they were younger. Now that they've gotten older, their immune tolerance has gone down and now they can't fight off those heavy metal immune react- inflammatory reactions. Now the disease process starts without any new trigger, just the fact that they're getting older. Um, but heavy metals, um, there's a few issues with them. One of them is that, first of all, we all have them. When I, when I was doing my research in some of the studies we published, we did find heavy metals bind to protein, albumin. They do become antibodies. And we did it with mercury and we did it with a mixture composite of different heavy metals. But heavy metals make antibodies, they like get a mercury bound to albumin antibodies. And then that's about 10 to 50% of subjects we tested. And those people for sure have autoimmune antibodies uh, in the 90 percentile when you test them. So so again, we all get exposed and never have the same reaction to them. There's all these other variables that determines what kind of reaction we have. In animal studies, if they give enough of it, heavy metal, they can turn on autoimmune disease. But that's like <laughs> that's like toxic loads, right? We're all getting some exposure, but not necessarily toxic loads unless we unless some weird incident happens. Um, but do you get rid of them? And if you get rid of them, how do you get rid of them? And this is where chelation comes in. And this is where things get a little scary because chelation has been shown to redistribute these chemicals, especially into the brain. So DMSA, DMPS, DMS, uh, EDTA have all been shown to cause some heavy metal redistribution. So I've seen autoimmune disease patients completely fall apart once they started chelation therapy, which is a way to get rid of them. And I remember the when I was very young in my practice, the first time that happened at, at, a, at a, a patient that and became dis- had severe disability with multiple sclerosis because of that right after chelation therapy. I didn't know why that happened a second time. And that time I had, had clear knowledge. So I was able uh, to see that they had autoantibodies against mercury bound proteins and, and myelin at the same time. They both went up together and they can go up at the same time as they flare up. So it's like, okay, this is a chemical chemical response. So if you chelate and you push chemicals out of your t- tissues into your bloodstream, if your bloodstream is reacting against them, you could get a flare up, even though you're trying to do the proper treatment. So then it came to, you have to be healthy enough to handle chelation. If you're trying to eliminate them because you can't really get rid of heavy metals with um, your liver pathways, right? So there's certain chemicals that are persistent and some chemicals that are non-persistent pollutants, right? So chemicals like fire retardants and BPA, our body can clear. We have pathways in our liver and our microbiome that can clear them. So they're um, not persistent pollutants, but pers- persistent pollutants, our body cannot clear them out of our liver pathways. And that's where heavy metals comes. They, they're in that whole, that whole other category. So the only chance we have to get rid of them is through chelation, to have something bind to them and get them out. And then there's natural chelators like N-acetylcysteine, uh, like people use all the time, Corellia and uh, various things, but yeah, they're okay. Uh, glutathione is also has properties like an acetylcysteine uh, that bind to them. Uh, but if someone has a, so for us, like for me, my practice is a patient wants to consider having metal chelation. And I go, okay, well, here's the risk factors. You can have redistribution. Let's make sure your blood brain barrier is intact. So you can measure a lab marker called S100B. And S100B is a, a surrogate marker for blood brain barrier permeability. Every single lab does it. It's a conventional lab test. And then you can actually measure things like blood brain barrier permeability proteins to see if the blood brain barriers breach. And then we can also check the gut barrier for permeability, like zonulin and antibody levels. 
And if there's if their blood brain barriers breached, and if they have antibodies to chemicals, it's not a good time to do heavy metal chelation because that's when you can get a flare up. So what we like to do is have them not have have their immune tolerance improved. So they stop having chemical antibody reactions and then get their blood brain barrier intact. So they're no longer showing any blood barrier permeability biomarkers and only get biomarkers. And then if they want to do heavy metal clearance, that'd be a good time to consider. So that's how I'm doing. <laughs> Dr. Karazian, so much value. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful for you and your time. And uh, I want to be respectful of it. Is there anywhere you'd like to send our listeners to learn more from you? Um, anywhere specific you'd like to have them go? <laughs> um, well, I do have a web page for, I have, I have a website and education for healthcare professionals, which is the Karazian Institute. Uh, Karazian is K-H-A-R-R-A-Z-I-N institute.com. That's where I have uh, courses for healthcare professionals. And then for people that uh, are just f- for focusing on how to improve their health, but they're not a healthcare specialist, I have a website called Dr. K News, D-R-K-N-E-W-S.com. I have write articles and try to share information with them. And I have a podcast, uh, Solving the Puzzle with Dr. Karazian. That's, that's how I disseminate information to everyone. So thank you for allowing me to share that. Yeah, the best information, autoimmunity, functional neurology, brain inflammation. Thank you so much. I'm incredibly thank grateful you. for you. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. And that's a wrap, ladies and gents. Thank you very much for tuning into the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. As always, I'm incredibly grateful for you being here. I know you found a ton of value in that. If you're someone who wants to help others live their greatest life in a body they love, go ahead and share this podcast with at least one person you know and love who ultimately is aiming to thrive. Dr. Karazian is an absolute gem of a human, a great guy, and just a brilliant, brilliant man who has so much value to offer. He is the authority when it comes to autoimmunity in the world. So if you know anyone who ultimately is suffering from autoimmunity or maybe some illness that they're not sure what it is, I highly suggest you check out his podcast. You can check out his website and also check him out on YouTube, all of which have been linked in the show notes. Thanks once again to our sponsor, Organifi, for hooking us up with 20% off the highest quality greens, reds, and golden milk product that I've ever used. Just absolutely phenomenal products. Um, So the Reds product, as I say, is probably my personal favorite that I consistently use on a regular basis. I love it for its vasodilation properties. So uh, if you guys don't understand that red drinks tend to increase nitric oxide, they tend to allow for a little bit better um, vasodilation of of the uh, vascular system. So I'm a huge fan of that product right around the workouts, either as a pre-workout, sometimes even as an intra-workout, or certainly as a post-workout recovery drink to just, just accelerate recovery for me. And I also use the gold the milk product, oftentimes before bed, it's loaded with turmeric and adaptogens to help support the parasympathetic nervous system. And believe me when I tell you, it tastes phenomenal. It's absolutely a nice treat. So if you're someone who likes to have a little treat after dinner or before bed, I highly suggest you check out the golden milk formula from Organifi. Thanks guys for being here. Once again, I appreciate you. I know you guys have many podcasts to choose from and I'm super grateful you continue coming back to mine. Have a great day and live your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.